I think I'm smiling so hard the back of my head hurts, but uh, I'm smiling because I'm happy. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it worked out. I think we did a good season, and now we're going to start trying to make the third season better. So. Definitely. After tonight. <laughs>Well, season 324, and uh, we're on episode five and six, and we have a very complicated and complex action scene coming up, which involves uh, helicopters. The question becomes this. If this is Jack's helicopter, this is military helicopter, this is camera helicopter, that's why it looks as stupid as it does. Because the doors are closed on this, could we set up a plate camera in here and in here at the same time? It's, it's very complex, it's, it's a bit on the danger side. We've got to make sure that all the safety elements are in place. Uh, and then just again, as always, coordinating all the different departments to make sure that everybody's in place for the day. Depending on time, I want to do a little traffic thing with Chase. On as if it's a complete different street, yeah, just kind of can whizzing we around cars. Can we get some more makeup on John for this, please? <laughs> the shot. He's doing it all the time, can I just sit here? Is, is this Kassar too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's what it is, isn't it? Return of you know, Kassar. sequels are never as good as the first one. So. It's easy. You just smile, then pull the trigger. Yes, sir. This is a, a scene which John Kassar was very excited to, to do, and it's the major scene in this, in this uh, episode. Uh, and unfortunately he had a family emergency and, and had to leave on that. For about three hours I was going to step in and be the director and then Ian Toynan came in later and uh, took over. So for Ian it's a challenge too because he hasn't been up to speed in, in prepping this episode and he's scrambling to stay on top of what the implications are with clothing and the aftermath. As if you're trying to smash into a glass or a, 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 a light, or we'll never know. I've just done three and four, so I'm in post on three and four, prepping seven and eight. Um, and I've stepped in because the last time we left Jack and Salazar was in at the end of episode four, so I was the last time I was shooting. I was shooting here in this prison, so it's just a, it's one step forward for me to carry on here. So. Wait there a minute, lads. Wait for the cue for me. Wait for the cue. I'm going to see this on this camera as well. It's very difficult for a director to come in and, and work on someone else's show when they've never prepped for it. But normally, if you're shooting for 15 days, you have 15 days of prep. Naturally, you never really look at the other director's material because you're preoccupied with your own. Oh, look at that. Cut! Printed. Cut! The challenge for him is that John was excited by the scene. It's a powerful scene. It plays pretty well by itself with actors of this caliber. And we can light it and stage it in such a way that it's dramatic. But John must have had a vision as how he wanted it shot. And so Ian has to do his own thing. And so he hopes that John will be happy with what he gets. You know? So that's, that's a, a lot of pressure. We're in the middle of shooting episodes five and six. My character is in, is in the middle of a prison riot. There's so many different things that could possibly make this sequence complex, but predominantly it would be the number of people involved. Most scenes take place with one, two, three, four, and maybe five people, and here you're dealing with 25, 30. Uh, and on top of that is really physical. Uh, and so to coordinate that uh, is a huge task. So what we're doing is staging a riot. It's a TV show, all right? We're gonna make it look crazy. That doesn't mean that you go crazy. There are times when guys, you know, they really get into it, and they're like, you know, they got aggression and they want to get it out. They're like, fuck, man, this is, a, this is a way I can break a chair over someone's back or something. And it's not, you know, you think I'm kidding. I've seen it happen on set. And it's not, it's not, you know, next thing you know, you got someone going to the hospital because someone got a little gung-ho. If I feel like you're getting crazy to the point where you're uncontrollable, it's ticking home, all right? And we'll call Central, and you will not work with us again. About yes, we're there. Blue bottle. Hey. Did you get a, did I get a stain in the wall? We I don't think so. No, I should. Just free color.
to discuss the conversation on the today. And cut. Cut. Nice. Right. That was nice. Right. Nicely done, Ian. Yeah. That looked really good. Nicely done, guys. That looked great. Yes. Okay, space guy butterflied it. Okay, and I'm gonna put the ice on there. We'll keep the swelling down. Okay, so just kind of let it cover. Hold it up there. Right. So when we're not actually working, we're just relaxing. If you want to call us sitting around for six hours relaxing, I mean, to some people it actually sounds like, well, that's an easy day, but it's not as easy as you think, just uh, four or five days a week sitting around. As far as being glamorous, it's not glamorous. We got problems. Yes, we do, buddy. Yeah. one of my secrets, man. Yeah. My bigger is. Prisoners are going to take off. You guys are going to chase them from this way. Guards are going to come and chase them from this way. Okay. Okay. Five. What can I do to keep this alive? Five. We're ready. Two background artists, 101. The best of the best. <laughs> <laughs> when they need the shot in one take, get us. Hey, my points, please. No, sir. I go to the bad boy clubs, he goes to the good guy clubs, you know? Right. Yeah. The manhole. <laughs> Take another time. Oh, man, and then he keeps going every time. No, come on, you can't count? Some of you guys go that way, some of you guys go this way. Peel up, peel up. No, he can play, that's right. That's the one I was looking for. Yeah, guess who's back? Oh, <laughs> Ah! Seven. Still keeping my lead. <sighs> The cracker wins again. <laughs> now, being uh, in the prison here, did you do any research of what prison life is like, uh, institutional life? Not on purpose. Not on purpose. We live in a prison society. I mean, I, I think there are rough estimates that I think one in four men will go through the prison system by the year 2007 or something like that. But certainly when you first walk into the building, you know what you're here to do. And, uh, and in that case, yeah, working in a real prison is, is much better than working on a set. Uh, the fact that you can watch, look, and all, look all the way down the hallway and see the prison just going on and on for days. It, it, anything that can help lend a sense of reality to what can potentially be a very unrealistic situation is obviously very helpful. I worked in this place about seven years ago, and it had just been decommissioned, and it was a woman's prison. And you do, when you stand in the cells downstairs, you're first in here alone, you're lighting it and so on, you do think about the people that were here. The vibe in this building is pretty powerful. I showed up a little bit early uh, both days just to get a feel of the prison, to uh, get a feel of what it's like to be incarcerated, you know? I mean, I've had I spent some time in jail, but that was years back when I was a kid, you know? When I came in, I went back, uh, far back in the cell block, and, uh, you know, I'm sitting in the cell, and just kind of thinking, and I see this dead lizard, like, the, the carcass of it, man, just right underneath the bed, and, you know, I'm sitting there just kind of uh, taking in everything, you know, just the, uh, the isolation, the, uh, the loneliness, um, the desperation. You know, and just trying to work that all into this this character, Peel. You know, because Peel is just this—he's this badass. He's he's this sadistic uh, inmate who is uh, who's going to have some fun. Yep. Whack. That looks nice and strong. Very nice. An action. But it's very funny once you actually block out a scene and start working on that one specific moment. 
you start to really feel blinders go up and, and you become very concentrated on a very specific area. Um, and at that point, uh, something else takes over. Today we're doing a bunch of fights, a yeah, riot sequence with our boss, Greg Barnett, stunt coordinator. Greg, Greg, yes. you want him to settle in there and then kick? I think if maybe Teddy was on his knees or something and he fell into place, once he starts to come up and you just kick him, that'll okay. sail him. On action, you come up. So, uh, how many times have you been killed on this series? I'm trying to count how many, because it's been quite a few, but I'd say about four times. Well, uh, as you may have recognized me on the last show of the season last year, I got shot by uh, Jack, the sniper, in the uh, Coliseum sequence. At the LA Coliseum, it was a rough day. Keeper, sharpshooter, killing everybody in sight. Me, including. We all died that day. On 24, the, the stunt the stunt jobs are so tough. We, we just, we work so hard that, uh, oh, you can just tell what goes on here. We have to take a breather once in a while. Oh, these hardworking fellas. Good job. Good job, Teddy. Good job, buddy. <laughs> Get deep in character, man. I like that. It's playing the dead guy, wasn't it? It's all that hard work on the floor. And this is the laundry area where usually in a prison, bad things always happen in laundry areas. Uh, you know this from Shawshank Redemption and the, the history of jails and prisoners especially when they have hostages. So Jack is going to be dragged in here now with a bunch of angry men and we're going to see what happens. Roll sound. We're rolling. And action, action, action. Let's start wasting the guards unless they let us walk. Yeah, to the first step outside, bam! Headshot from a sniper. You doing? Six, seven, eight, nine, ten, sometimes twenty takes, and you know, uh, for me, I, I'm fearful of, of losing the energy or losing certain moments that I've created. But um, no, this isn't so bad. You know, I'm just keeping it going, keeping keeping uh, the character in my head, keeping the intensity in my head, keeping all that going, and uh, just trying to lay down some good work. Okay, let's try it again. Who wants to live? Me. Everybody's done such a great job of making this so real. Like, I don't feel like we're playing, you know. Lobo's got his hand around my neck and calling me, you know, all kinds of stuff. <laughs> I don't feel like we're playing. It's, it feels very real. It, 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 it smells real. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of cats in there, so. I think one of the most important things I think I've ever learned as an actor uh, was time management. There's times to goof off and have fun, and, and there's times to really conserve your energy. And this show is about putting yourself in a really heightened experience and, and situation. And, and it does require a lot of energy. Um, and so you just have to really make sure that you're saving all of your juice or your energy or, or any of it uh, for those very specific moments between action and cut. Uh, working with Kiefer has been great. Um, even though it's such a, a quick beat and puts the end on the act, I felt like he was present every single take and it was able to help me get there. And it was just, it was good for me because it kept everything really close and, and fresh and, and just visceral. I mean, to look into his eyes and to have him telling me to do this, it's disbelief, it's... It's this almost, it's this almost comfort. Yeah! It's here for the new guy. I'd have to say I like playing the bad guy. I mean, I, I like throwing down that kind of intensity. I like all the different layers that uh, a bad guy can bring to, uh, to the table. And you know, that's normally what I play, bad guys, and I have this running joke. We're either going to jail or we're getting killed. But you know, that just makes the good guy look even better. We're just, we're really excited about how well these guys have done. Uh, these are some actors over the last few days that we've worked with for the first time. 
and they've just done such a fantastic job. So we're starting to actually, as we're nearing the end of shooting the sequence, uh, people are breathing a little easier because I think they're starting to realize that something good's going to come of this. Is Kiefer on his way? Kiefer will be on his way as soon as we leave here to head there. Uh, cue him in. Call him in. Yeah. Call him in. I'm going to have to stop, lads. I'm in this scene, uh, my conception of the Russian roulette scene was, I've seen Russian roulette, I've seen it done well, I've seen it done poorly. One thing I haven't seen is the first time the guy pulls the trigger, he dies. So I think that's a legitimate surprise for the audience, but it's not, it's not unreal. We're always amazed uh, with the ideas that they come up with and the scenarios because it's proven itself to be incredibly difficult to to write around the structure that we have, which is encompassing simply a 24-hour period. You know, one of the keys to this show is, and I'm, I think when the viewer watches it, they have this experience of, you know, you're kind of leaning forward in your chair. My mother says she has to take a Xanax when she watches it. She gets very tense. We will show things and do things that other TV shows won't do. Uh, we will let a guy get shot in the head right off the bat. And I think that is very uh, exciting and dangerous for the viewer. One of one of the vices of our show is is, is that in extreme circumstances, uh, problems can be solved. Uh, and this scene was well, uh, well structured uh, for that to take place. It also, one of the interesting things is it takes two people that are diametrically opposed. Uh, one is a villain and one is a, is a good guy and they all of a sudden have to work together in a situation uh, to save each other. And that certainly dramatically is a, is a very, complex and exciting thing to try and play. Oh, this is a t it's been a tough couple of days. I mean, it's tough. But at the end of the day, I, th I hope they're as good as I feel they are. Um, I think we've had a couple of amazing days. The director who showed this is, is coming back tomorrow to take over, but he's doing so right in the middle of a scene. Although the explosion will happen, we have chosen not to shoot it because it will carry on continuously into the rest of tomorrow's work, and John will be here to do that. So we're going to cut arbitrarily just as uh, Peel gets uh, squibbed and shot, and we're just going to cut. Because in the middle of that, at that precise moment, that whole wall is going to blow in, and uh, 10 SWAT guys are kind of running in, guns firing, and concussion grenades are going to go off, and there's going to be mayhem. OK, ready. Ready? And action on rehearsal. So, let's do this in slow motion, I'll show you what's gonna happen. We got a little screwed on our hole that's supposed to have five guys pour through. We got a little Stonehenge situation and they're gonna be really small SWAT guys. Look at it. How, how are six guys supposed to pile through that and, and catch these guys by surprise? Not unless they're fucking Lilliputs. Yeah. 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 Fucking bullshit, garbage, no one's fucking listening. No one fucking steps around the fucking corner and says, hey John, we got a fucking problem out in there. We gotta talk, we got fucking major problems. Did you see that hole? Yeah. OK. And why do, I got, why do we not have stunt guys for this big fucking stunt action scene? Uh, clearly, we're not going to be able to send six heavily armed stunt guys through that hole, whereas something approximating the vent and then across to the side and down to the floor, like a six foot by six foot opening, would have been what I would have had in mind. And I know John did. And we don't have that now. So we're going to have to minimize the impact of that, uh, try to avoid cut to it late and build it in the stage and do a parallel shot as it blows or something. But um, it's an unfortunate. Otherwise, what would have been a nice changeover, you know, because we did a good job in here yesterday and it's a powerful scene and uh, this is sort of unfortunate. So. But, you know, we'll, we'll get over it. We'll fix it. The gentleman behind Mr. Yeah. Southern was a lot of guy. Yeah, so that you've, got a, you've got a guy to double him, right? I know the guy's not here. Correct. Yeah. All we have is some white guy. Christopher. No, 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 no. We have a photo double. No, but I'm seeing. There's a stunt guy. You told me there's a stunt guy here that could double for you. No, I'm an extra. No, no. Oh, wait, wait, just let us finish. Well, let me show you. Let me show you. We have nobody. We have like two guys, and now we're doing like a now we're doing a stand-in as a stunt guy. Broadway, bam, exactly. So I'm working on my getting the hit knocked out type. So is this your big break? This is my big break. It's like being governor. <laughs> I can maybe someday be like Arnold, you know? 
I, I suppose they ran out of stunt people. Greg didn't have enough, Greg is a stunt coordinator, and I would suppose he didn't have enough people to do the job properly. So there I stood, uh, doubling one of my ethnicity. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. See Mark. Set. Ready and background. Do it! Do it! Do it! Do it! Do it! Do it! Everyone all right? <laughs> yeah, good. What are you doing, John? So far, we're making our day. No. <laughs> Not even close. But we will, we'll catch up. We always do. Oh, there's, you know what? There doesn't need to be additional pressure. There's always pressure just trying to make up the time we need to make up. Uh, again, we're incredibly ambitious these, these uh, few days. There's a lot to shoot. Any other way out? Now we're pinned in. You must have known this could happen. What's the plan, Jack? Give me the shotgun. Give me the shotgun. Cut. Uh, it's all very complicated with helicopters and lots of actions and lots of stunt people. So just a matter of just keeping our, you know, our sort of eye on the goal and just moving forward as fast as we can. Guys, did you hear that? If we don't get this in 15 minutes, we don't have it. So we got to go, like right now. Start my car. Let me show you the rush. That's why. That sun is yes. going to go down yes. really yes. fast. And if we don't. Get the shot, we'll be screwed. Right, Mike? That's absolutely screwed. And Mike knows, because he's got all screwed. his sun things that give us all yeah. the... 45 minutes, we're dead. 45 minutes, show him the trick. What's the, what's the wind speed right now, Mike? This is the calculation. Three fingers, 45 minutes, four fingers, an hour. An hour. Every, yeah, every, every, 45 every, minutes. Every finger is 15 minutes. High tech. Except for your small finger, and it's only 10. Yeah. <laughs> Close ain't gonna cut it this time. I gotta deliver Salazar. I'm not letting you go, Jack. How long is it gonna take you to find Cal Singer? A half an hour, an hour? I gotta get Salazar in the air in that chopper in the next 60 seconds or 100,000 people will die. You choose. And cut. Do one more right away, please. Go again, right away. The only dreams I have about 24 are dreams about days going incredibly badly. And I keep looking at my watch, and I don't have the time to shoot all the shots I want to shoot to make this show good. Those are my dreams. I call them film nightmares. And I'm not the only one that has them. I spent a lot of time in a women's prison. <laughs> I did. My mother ran a, a prison, a jail, for a long time. Really? Yeah, yeah. So I feel like I'm back at home. <laughs> In this scene, I am doing off camera and I'm calling Badge, uh, his chase, and telling him that we found the, uh, the carrier of the virus, Kyle Singer. Once he flies away, I need my end act. Yeah. And my end act is coming into you like this, oh, yeah. seeing him go, oh, fuck moment, and then go. If you go too early, I don't get that. Yeah, okay? So wait till he, you'll feel him. He'll be right in your face. And when you feel him in your face, take that moment, watching him go, starting to go, oh, fuck. I know where he's going, and go. Right now, my big worry as we uh, get ready to do our helicopter landing in a downtown street is, is that right now we've got a marine layer that's in here that's uh, very thick. It's like a fog that the helicopter can't fly in. Uh, they need three miles of visibility, and right now the visibility is about a mile and a half. So we're waiting. How much longer do you think it'll be? 
<laughs> when you see the sun come out. Now, it wouldn't be such a big deal if we could sit here all day and wait, but unfortunately, because by noon, uh, we can't have any helicopters in the air. Since 9-11, uh, there's, a, there's a rule, a, you know, a new law, that says that nothing could be flying in the city in a three-mile radius of, a, of an open stadium. And, of course, there's a Dodger game. So because that Dodger game happens, uh, an hour before the game, during the game, and an hour after the game, nothing can be in the air. So by noon, we either have the shot or our chopper gets grounded. How much longer do you think it'll be till uh, we're safe? Me? I, I would say at least an hour, but we can yeah, at least Yeah, I got the here. sun poking through here. We've got uh, three choppers waiting uh, at another site, ready to go up and do all our air-to-air -air, uh, shooting. And again, with uh, the conditions like they are now, that will not happen. Anyhow, so what we'll do, Rodney, to start from the same camera positions, I could do a really cool tight lens so you don't know where we are so much. Uh, Chase yeah. zipping through cars yeah. as if he's like racing behind the chopper. So we'll put cars there and he can go right in between. I can get that. Right. Well, I figure another 20 minutes maybe it would be better. The update is this. It's now 10 o'clock in two hours. We can't have this chopper downtown. It's landing at our base, which is good news. We're finishing a shot here and then we're going to have him come in. So. It's going to be tight. We'll be doing it right up to the deadline. So that's where we are right now. Our fingers are crossed. The good news is it's cleared up. So the choppers are flying. I don't think I like it even. It might come off straight away. I think they've taken off and it's a 10 minute flight time to here, so we should hear them any minute now. But we will be rolling him landing on this first pass, just to get, just to get, I mean, not, not the actual landing itself, but coming in uh, and as much footage as we can get. You got it. Here they come, here they come. Here they come. Rolling, 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 lock it up. My boys are trained now. Trained to roll every time they see a chopper fly. Roll. I need an AD. I need an AD right here, right now. Okay, cameras, we had a problem. I don't know if you were told, but we had a problem. So save your film. Make sure you do not run out of film for the landing. Do not run out of film for the landing. We never talked about having to clear that. He was always coming over here. Yeah. I got 8,000 homeless people over there who are mental. They don't understand the word move. It changed. He was supposed to land straight uh, I down. Know, I get that. Now but, he says he has to land. But we fly over oh. people all the time. I, I'm not, I don't know that. I, I, I mean, when we came in over the prison, we flew over the whole crew. Right. The crew is one thing. Civilians are something else. Oh, really? Well, is, it, uh, is it an FAA thing? Yeah, oh. yeah. OK. All right, here we go. They're coming into the landing this time. Lock it up. Okay, boys. Here we go. I love this. I love that. Now, let's see, Krishna, where are you? Michael, what are you doing? Michael, what are you doing? That's great, zooming in, going by. Oh, yeah! Shut it down. Shut it down. Woo! We just got it in on time. It's 12. As you see, see, our show, the way we shoot the show is exactly what the show is about. Time, 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 and how quickly we can get things done and how quickly we can get them in the little time we have. So we did it. The chopper's in the middle of the street, which is great. Right now, I'm extremely happy because we got everything we needed. Now we're going to send it away so they can do all the air to air. And that's going to look awesome. Got to go.
way it works uh, in America when you have the military is that uh, first of all, request comes in. In this case, it came uh, through the 24 and the folks at Fox got a hold of the Marine Corps, requested the aircraft. Next stop on that is we look at, hey, this is a great opportunity. It's generally, you know, uh, puts the military in a good light. It goes to the Pentagon. So uh, good morning, everyone. Welcome to our, our day that we've been uh, waiting for for uh, about six weeks now. My name's Nicole, if you don't know me, I'm the first AD today. This is Tim Isofano, our producer and director for today. Um, I'm going to introduce Terry Thomas, who's our liaison and the man in charge today of our F-18s. At the Pentagon, they review it, want to find out what's going on. Obviously, this, this uh, production was bigger than most because you're talking about jet fighters in L.A. and obviously with all the things going on in the world at this time, uh, you know, carefully reviewed it. But at the end, Department of Defense says it's a go. What we need to do is make it really tight for LAPD PD to hold traffic today because we have uh, some kind of uh, Mexican fiesta happening downtown. So we all need to make sure that we are ready and set. Hey, there's a gas can uh, at the back of your all's trailer. I was wondering if we could put some gas in that and send it to set. Uh, for a $20 bill. That won't be a problem. What we're simulating, by the way, is um, a bomb drop. Yep. It's not missiles. So what will happen is the Marines who are on patrol over the marina in our story come in, they'll come down, they'll come down the river like this, this rough formation, They'll drop bombs right about here. The helicopter will blow up. Then they'll peel off to the east. It's a poor imitation of that shot in Star Wars when they hit the Death Star and oh, right. they're going yeah, through those little, yeah, that kind of thing. We've got a uh, camera here, which is going to be covering Kiefer. we got a camera on that bridge. we got a camera on this bridge. And then there's a dependable warehouse there down deep that will have uh, our fourth camera and our fifth camera is in the helicopter. I'll give you guys the general shot um, that I want you to get. And uh, if you get it after that, hey, have a good time. Because I know you're all real good at this stuff and we could get, you know, a million good shots and make this thing work terrifically. Well, oh, yeah, this, this is Cheryl Jones. She's with the uh, FAA. And as you know, there's about 9 million aircraft above Southern California at any time during the day. And what Cheryl has done is figured out this great path to get two warplanes into this <laughs> very crowded airspace so that we could do this. I mean, without her, yeah, without, yeah, without her, <laughs> I embarrass you enough. <laughs> no, don't knock the coke over. And there they go. <laughs> Well, generally, second unit is something that you run out of time doing on first unit. Traditionally, it used to be anything that was inserted, something you can recreate at a later time. And uh, in the case of our show, it seems to be getting more and more into the idea of staging larger stunts like this. Uh, this exclusively had to take place on a Sunday, and uh, they did not want to work the, uh, the main A crew on a sixth day for financial reasons. Stan, our effects guy, is thrilled because he gets to, uh, to blow this helicopter again. He wasn't totally satisfied with the first blow, so uh, I'm sure it'll be spectacularly large today. Can you believe they put that to back together? I know. <laughs> I know. <It laughs> there was, was nothing left except for the tail laying on I the ground. I know. Crowd. The tail was on the ground. The front was all burned up. It was gone. It, I know. it, it was... shredded open like nothing. We sort of did it like the uh, okay. NTSB, laid all the parts we could find, laid it all out, started figuring out where everything went and wired it back together. So it's basically as good as we could get it with what we could find on the ground after the first explosion. We were gonna shoot it last Sunday, which gave us three days, which was uh, a little bit of a push, but uh, hopefully this time when we take it apart, we won't be putting it back together, so. I'm gonna save it. I'm gonna we'll pick up the pieces again because oh. next year, who yeah, knows? You, gotta you know, use it. Look. it'll be one of those reoccurring things yeah. that go up all the time. The uh, fun part about this is we very rarely get to work with uh, TV series. You know, usually it's Hollywood and movie making, but to uh, work with a, a series that's on TV every week, uh, that's rare. Tiger Six, can you give us a uh, time hack ETA on target over? Roger out. 
Five minutes. Might move now. It's just five minutes. Five minute warning for you, Randy. Let's go ahead and uh, hold traffic, please. He's coming right, so he's broke stick. Hey guys, camera. Uh, Berger making a hard right coming in. We can see him here in just a second. Uh, we are not rolling, though, correct? No. That is correct. We are not rolling. This is just another rehearsal for for the planes. Obviously, what you're going to see today is a, we call it SIMCAS, a simulated close air support mission. And I was at the unit in the, the war in Iraq called Anglico. And Anglico stands for Air Naval Gunfire Liaison Company. And that company, that's, that mission is designed that you have a team of Marines that can attach to an Army unit or an Allied unit. In this case, we attach to the British. Uh, and we called airstrikes using U.S. assets on their behalf. We call artillery, call mortars, call airstrikes with fixed wing being jets or rotary wing being uh, helicopters. But, set, but hold so that they can move that camera position, okay? And then go hot on the effects after this run. It's going to be very realistic in the sense that you're going to see two aircraft flying close by in a tight uh, formation. Uh, they're going to be controlled from the ground. They're going to come up from a high altitude, quickly drop, and move over the target. Uh, and with the uh, the simulation effects, seeing these explosions, primary and secondary, very realistic. The only thing that might not be 100% realistic is a lot of times we may have that second bird stand off maybe 30 seconds behind it because a lot of times you may drop a bomb and it may just miss the target. So by having that plane 30 seconds behind it, that radio controller on the ground that, that I'm simulating today um, and what the actor, uh, Kiefer Sutherland, is, is doing is he could actually adjust and saying, you know, from that first bomb, adjust 100 meters west, 100 meters north. Oh, that was awesome. How close? Okay, guys, we're about 15 seconds out. Stand by. There they are. Speed. Oh, there he is. No, it's faster. There he is. Got him. Oh, come on. We're going six? Yeah. Jets coming around. There they are. There they are. Okay. Um, oh, look at that. That was just totally tight. Oh, man. Classic. Let's attack V wing. They're just like right in there. Nice. Yeah, the footage only gets better the more they do this. Yeah. Look at that. That's just evil. Oh, that is. <laughs> I wish I was back in there. Look at that one. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh man! Look at that. So it's got to be, we're doing it three separate circuits to keep the gas or the fire rolling the whole time. We have to keep setting off different ones to keep it going instead of just one big one in slow motion. I'm going to be watching you whenever you come off of that helicopter. Yeah. And whenever you get to me, I'm just going to say, helicopter's been taken out, and I'm going to get up and go. Right, right. Krishna, when he's got his optimum position, then we'll blow the, the, the helicopter. Good. Yeah. So far, we're riding on the money today. This is a run like clockwork. That's cool. Look at that. You get... Oh, that's really good. Oh, that's, that's really that's... good. That is sweet. Here they come. There they are, Krishna. They're making their turn.
one that was good. All right. Oh, just you know, the, the shadow, we saw the boom, you picked the jets. When you have Metropolitan City, the FAA on board, studios on board, all the local law enforcement, the mayor's office, marine fire planes, we had marine radio operators, LA, you know, Hollywood office, the Navy folks came down, I mean, it was a total team effort. So, and you put off for one hour in one of the busiest cities in the world, you can't beat a day like that. Toppers are taken out. Carves all the space out of the sky to get those fighter planes in here. World's busiest airspace, and she made it work. We saw the shadows of the jet, the boom, and then up to them, and then you run in. It was so cool. On days like this, this is it. This is the day to do it. I mean, uh, I had all the toys. I had F-18s, I had cameras, I had, you know, it was... Probably the biggest day of my career. It really was. It was really that exciting. I mean, maybe the film will only go 20, 30 seconds, but to put all this together, that in itself was just, it was, it was really exciting. The following documentary contains graphic images that may not be suitable for children or squeamish adults. Hey, Mark. Hey, Mark. And plane. Ready? And The challenge in writing for a bioterrorist attack is the visual and visceral impact it has on the viewer. Whereas with a nuclear bomb or um, uh, an assassination attempt, everybody knows what, what it looks like. It was very challenging to find a virus with a 90% kill rate, viruses want to live and be passed on, and they don't tend to exhibit symptoms as quickly as ours does. So it was very challenging to find a virus that did. And in the end, we gave up and invented our own. What do you think it is? Run a full panel of tests just to be sure. But I think we're dealing with a mnemonic virus, type 3. We tell Anne, this is what we want to do. We want to have this virus show symptoms of people in two hours. Can you find research that supports that? We don't just go out and go, how does it work? It's not that easy to find a virologist. You can't just get them on the phone. <laughs> we wanted someone who had expertise in some extreme, like level three, highly dangerous viruses, because then they would know issues of quarantine, they would know, well, the type of equipment that you need, the safety measures required in dealing with these highly dangerous viruses. I'm studying uh, infectious diseases in nature, so I'm focusing on uh, uh, hantaviruses and tick-borne encephalitis uh, and their uh, host, which are mostly mice and voles. These are small rodents, and, uh, th and they are the, the most important uh, reservoir of these viruses. The hantavirus is in the Ebola virus family, and so it was something that we felt might be relevant. Certainly, Dr. Ratz's specific knowledge about viruses has been invaluable. The problem with hantavirus is that occasionally they infect uh, people. Hantaviruses are not specifically targeting humans. So they don't cause any problem for the mice. However, uh, when they infect a human person, the consequences can be quite serious. Tail is 75, Hermes is true eye. Here in the Southwest, they cause a disease so-called hantavirus pulmonary syndrome, and uh, it has a high mortality rate. It can be as high as 50% your blood fluid starts to infl infiltrate into your lung. And, uh, and basically, uh, you are suffocating because your lung fills up with your blood. National Center for Infectious Diseases, this is Diane. The hardest part of my job is the initial contact and cold calling places like the CIA and the FBI and 
the CDC and saying, hey, can I talk to someone about a virus that could wipe out, you know, thousands of people, that gets you on a watch list. Yes, Dr. Mitch Cohen is in the middle of an interview. May I take a message? There are a number of, of viruses uh, and bacteria that can cause uh, diseases similar uh, to the fictitious virus that's on the show. Uh, many of these uh, viruses can be transmitted from person to person. Some of them occur in animals and can be transmitted from animals to people. Particularly if the virus is inhaled, it can cause a disease in the lungs, uh, cause a pneumonia-like illness, which can be rapidly fatal. Dr. Cohen helped us shape our virus response. He was very key in helping us understand on a sort of national level what the United States response would be and he also helped us keep our virus consistent and believable in the same way Dr. Rotz did. There's a non-contagious latency period of 14 hours. After 14 it presents, after 20 the host is incapacitated, by 24 the host is dead. There are, there are diseases that can result in a, a very serious and fatal illness in a very short time period. One such disease is meningococcal meningitis. Uh, this is a bacterial infection that affects the lining of the brain. And an individual can be perfectly healthy uh, one day and then within a few hours have uh, an illness that is not so very severe and actually be dead within 24 hours. So there are illnesses that can progress very rapidly, taking someone who is otherwise healthy and resulting in a quick death. The ability uh, for, for man to manipulate microorganisms is quite great. Now, whether or not a given change or manipulation by inserting a toxin or changing a gene will give you the desired result, you don't know. You may find that by doing that type of an experiment that the organism does become more virulent but you might have to do that experiment a thousand times to get a more virulent. So it's not predictable whether a given type of, uh, of genetic manipulation would produce an organism that was virulent, avirulent, or seriously virulent. The reality of could someone in their backyard or back basement create a weapon of mass destruction that they could release is a question obviously that we deal with all the time. I think, and that's why we always look at the example of anthrax, which is a naturally occurring um, bacteria in the environment that can li live in the spore form and is not fragile and is not infected by uh, routine mechanisms. I think when you start talking about some of these viruses like Ebola virus or the SARS virus or even the virus that was used in this script, I mean obviously you're going to have to be technically very savvy otherwise people are going to be dying like flies handling the virus. In reality to use viruses in the bioterrorism act it would be very difficult. Um, the, I can understand the fear because, you know, if uh, uh, to, to create a nuclear weapon, you know, you need the resources, you know, uranium, and the source of uranium is limited. You can find a uranium de deposit only a few places on, on Earth, and first you have to get those, you know, the, the raw material. On the other hand, you can find viruses everywhere in nature, so people think that, you know, it's easily accessible. However, it's not, you know, not that fast. Dealing with, with viruses is actually very difficult. Um, and, uh, and manipulating viruses for your own purpose is very difficult. I called my sister who's a biologist and she helped me track down Dr. Gabor Ratz who I got on the phone with and he said, we don't have any viruses that are like that, that you get sick guaranteed within 12 hours. You know, it's something that's really that specific. So we ha he said, why don't you weaponize it? Unfortunately, the news isn't good. This is a weaponized strain. The virus has been engineered to kill more rapidly. How rapidly? So the writers loved the idea that it would be weaponized because then we could control it. And so we weaponized it to fit our exact specifications. In, in the show, how did you work with them in terms of weaponizing the virus? 
Well, um, that's a difficult question because uh, it's the top secret how to weaponize viruses and that's not my main research. But, uh, but we try to make it uh, authentic. So. Come on, how do you do it? <laughs> So nature itself has a tremendous ability to modify and cause diseases. When a disease originates, there is a great potential that the disease can be very severe and diseases may attenuate as they're passed through a population. So there is a potential that the emergence of a new disease, whether one that occurs naturally or one that occurs through uh, manipulations of genes by man, could have a very high transmission rate, could have a very high mortality rate, be spread rapidly and cause massive illness and death. All right, what are the uh, epidemiological consequences? If the virus initiates at a single location, there will be a couple hundred cases by the end of day one. By the end of day two, it could be in the thousands, and from there, it's easier to talk about in percentage of population. By the end of the first week, 9% of Los Angeles County will be infected. 9%? That's over a million people. It's hard to think of a virus, in my mind, that would go in a, in, you know, in a person to person way, which is what more or less the show talked about, person to person infecting hundreds of thousands. If there was something that was aerosolized uh, you know, over the environment, that perhaps could infect thousands of people. Again, if you're thinking a stadium release, everyone getting exposed, then going home, you could see the ripple effect. When you look at the SARS epidemic, there were 8,000 people that got infected, and they really say it was like five or six people that caused all those clusters. So that was 8,000 people from five. If you go back to that natural occurring model, perhaps something like that could happen. That took, though, over four months. It could happen. That actually is a sobering thought when I think about that. We start our research after we've already got our stories. And then we find research that supports it. Unfortunately, what you can imagine is usually true. I mean, as outrageous as some of the stuff that we come up with, there's always research there to support it, especially in the theoretical. I mean, Los Angeles obviously is a huge city. You know, it covers over 4,000 square miles and has over 10 million population. We have many ports, we have a large airport. Obviously, I think Los Angeles County uh, and the environment is considered a target for bioterrorist events. If we were uh, notified that there was uh, a threat of a, a bioterrorism attack, uh, there's you know, several things that we would do. We certainly would start coordinating with all the other federal organizations that are involved in such a response. Another thing that CDC has been responsible for has been the strategic national stockpile, uh, which is able to provide uh, treatments or supportive care uh, for individuals who become ill. And this is a, a rapidly movable stockpile that can treat very large numbers of people. If a bioterrorist agent was released in L.A. County, obviously we have a protocol-driven action plan that follows the military model of incident command. I mean, it's very important to have these models drilled into you because obviously we're all going to be a little panicked when, th when that alarm goes off. It just so happens today, February 3rd, 2004, we just had a uh, report of a uh, ricin outbreak in the Senate building, you know, and that's... Uh, that's that small little mini outbreak, whatever this is, and it's not known right now what it is, it creates, creates a panic. If 10 people died of it, it would create a bigger panic. What should we do in a panic situation? I mean, basically what you have to think about is that worried minds don't listen. In other words, once people get panicked, you can educate them all you want, and I don't think that people are gonna listen. So the great role of the media and us as public health educators is to talk to people before they get worried. Everybody stay calm. Stay calm and quiet. Regarding bioterrorism, I feel that my fears have 
subsided. I feel that the more information I have about it and about quarantine and emergency procedures, the more I realize that like Dr. Mascola is very well equipped to deal with an outbreak. You know, I, I live in, in, in constant fear that a routine illness that we're just glossing over could be the beginnings of a bioterrorist event. What are you guys taking me? Hey, why won't you talk to me? Since 9-11, anything that could happen, you know, I feel like we have to be on the, on the cutting edge to make sure it's not happening in L.A. County, and it's scary. Biological warfare uh, and biological threats will unfortunately become scarier once they start to happen. On, on U.S. soil. Biological weapons have been used in, in warfare, you know, for hundreds of years. Uh, the Tartars used plague-infested uh, uh, clothes and they throw even corpses over the wall with catapults and uh, they were trying to infest uh, uh, citizens of towns. The main thing the producers were asking us for was a reality check and they also had some um, questions about what type of hazmat uh, equipment people would be wearing, you know, what type of level of personal protection would they be using, would they have full respirator gear on, would they not have full respirator gear. We have all these departments who are also doing their own research, very specific to their own needs. Well basically when we read the scripts we realized hazmat was going to become a big part of these episodes and it can be a nightmare. I mean, you're basically taking an outfit that is like locking somebody up in a Ziploc baggie and sealing them in with a respirator. Plug in our air supply. It's like trying to put your socks on when you're pregnant. I looked in catalogs to see what was available. These are basically the hazmats you get from the catalogs, which they actually use. And as you can hear, this sound isn't really good for anybody on camera. So we took the shape of it and then found our own fabrics and prototyped our own hazmats so that you wouldn't have that sound problem. We wanted to be able to get people dressed in the hazmat suits but we also, in between takes, we didn't want to have to unzip them completely. But I also want like the face shield to flip up so the actor could not, you know, stay totally zipped in the suit and could get air and not have to be removed in between takes. Yep, that'll do it. Cool. The question as to how we balance the scientific reality versus the dramatic uh, needs of the show is one that we get asked a lot because we try to convey a very real sense of the world of terrorism in our show. When, when we're writing scenes, if it's not dramatic, all the technical accuracy in the world will not repair it. And if it is dramatic, a little technical inaccuracy uh, or omission isn't going to hurt it. If someone was going to try to release this virus in the general population, how would they do it? That's the million dollar question. It's very challenging juggling my responsibilities to sort of reality and good research and necessities for the storyline. Quite often I'll take notes to the writers and they'll see me coming and, <laughs> and they'll say, oh here comes Anne with her notes, oh my goodness. <laughs> In every television show you see, whether it's ER, or it's a, a, a cop show, or a lawyer show, you are seeing heightened reality, or you are seeing something that uh, resonates with an inner truth, but not necessarily the procedural truth of the way things are. And, and we're the same way. Oh God, Dan, Danny. I think uh, the, the viewers of the show uh, are pretty much aware that this is a fictional story. I mean, the 24, uh, and so much action-packed, so much things happen, they don't sleep, they go, don't go to the bathroom, they don't have lunch break. Because our show is so time-based, so many notes um, become, okay, we want, to, we want to listen to these the reality, but we also need to really respect the storyline and what we're trying to create. All right, it's a nasal swab. 
just as reliable as a blood test, but we can get the results of the analysis much more quickly. How quickly? We should have the results within two hours. In, in reality, it's very difficult to do any kind of research and identify viruses within that time. Usually it takes much longer. You isolate the virus, and in, in order to just to identify the virus, you might have to spend a week on, you know, uh, doing some research. Uh, the first time we were sent the scripts, it was um, actually a little humorous to read it, and I, I felt like saying, God, I want to hire these people. I wish I had, you know, that technology and the ability to act as, as swift, swiftly as they acted. We're doubly uh, sort of crippled by the fact that we have to have things happen in real time, which in real life, in real life, things don't happen in real time. <laughs> what? There's no virus in the powder. We tested five samples. There weren't even trace amounts. Atmospheric and surface analysis also came up negative, and Kyle's parents tested negative as well. You sure about this? A good example of science versus reality. There's also a third component, which is our understanding of science, our understanding of something. Like, for example, um, it's widely understood that CIA agents have some kind of cyanide capsule that they would, if they're in a desperate situation, they can eat it and they'll die immediately. Michelle, I'm a doctor. I try to help people, not euthanize them. When they were saying how they would um, sort of euthanize the people that were exposed to the, the virus and yet, um, you know, would go on to die, they were going to give them um, cyanide, which is actually a very painful way to die. Like you convulse and you, you know, you're, it's terrible. You foam at the mouth and it can't, it doesn't necessarily happen right away. It's kind of brutal and we went back and forth so much. We want to be merciful to these people, but we want to have it be something that could be available at CTU. And in the end, we picked um, a suicide drug. <laughs> Just get rid of all of the research complexity and simplify it. The euthanasia drugs. Have you thought about how you're going to dispense them? So now is when you've come back down and they've lined up everyone in the hotel. You're going to be going through a process to get tested for the virus. As we come back, revealing the line here, it's not happy, chatty, waiting for your flight at the airport. It's, oh my God, I'm waiting in, in line for death, okay? When I saw that they had first identified that there was this virus loose in the building, and then they decided to keep all the people inside the building while they went through their analysis. I mean, we would never do that here in LA County. If we knew that there were people in risk of being exposed to something, we would get them out of the building right away. I want to make one thing clear right now. No one leaves this building until further notice. But for us, it was really just came down to money. I mean, can we afford to shoot an entire parking lot full of tents when we have this great hotel set we're using? And in the end, it became an issue of just logistics and, and uh, using the sets we had, as strange as that may sound. Well, it's not even that. I mean, the budget is always a constraint. Obviously, when you're doing something like a virus outbreak, you want to see it take effect over a city if you're trying to get maximum fright value, you want to see lots of people being affected by it. Uh, we don't have the budget for thousands of extras and lashing up huge, in, you know, quarantine tents, and so you you have to modify it. Everything that I have learned since researching and writing this show regarding biological threats, it's had the overall effect of making me believe that it is easier than I thought. If you're better prepared, your likelihood of you know, preventing uh, significant morbidity and mortality in yourself or in your population is going to be much greater. Now that I've learned more about it, I feel that terrorism has become less of a threat to me personally. In some way, viruses are integral part of our ecosystem. So, and, and there are examples when, when viruses are used 
for, for the good purpose. I think people put a lot of emphasis on preparing for bioterrorism, but the things that we can control, making sure our children are raised in a healthy environment, not using drugs or alcohol, that people, you know, work out and, and have exercise in their diet. We have an epidemic of obesity facing us, you know, but people would rather, you know, talk about weapons of mass destruction. I think our fast food industry is a weapon of mass de destruction, you know, that we should look at it that way. Job. I'm we should go. Yo, Jack. I don't need you anymore. Come on, Ramon. We had a deal. I gave you everything I said I would. I gave you the virus. We had a deal, and I lost my brother because of you. Because of you. <laughs> ah! Did everything I said I would. I got you the virus. Yes, we had the deal. And my brother died because of you. Because of you. Yep. And when we had a deal. I did everything I said I would. I got you the virus. We had a deal. And I lost my brother because of you. Because of you! We're all right. Set. Let's go again. Let's go again. From here. Keep going. Get up. Get up. No, no, no. No. Just stay down here. You ready? Yeah, ready.
Jack's moving in. Ramon's moving in on Nina and Jack. He's gonna kill him. The Delta team's not gonna get there in time. 30 seconds from contact, coming in from the east. Salazar has three men. I can't take them all out before they get to Jack. Salazar's on the move, the virus, repeat, he has the virus, he's heading west to 